our next speaker is someone who's who's a very close friend and I've, I've met her many many times uh, in the past and I, met, I remember meeting her at the Denim Dudes party at Amy Leverton's book launch her first book launch and she came she came up to me and she goes to me, you're, you're mental you are that's that's how she introduced herself you're mental you, you you are and I was like huh and then maybe a few months later I was gonna give up my job at, at Timberland and I'm like you know what let's reach out to this girl that I met because she is a denim designer and I pitched her for to be my like replacement and she got the job. So, you know, a fantastic start to our relationship. But no, your, you know, amazing career as well you, you've had. And I won't say much, but you can begin your prayer presentation. Lots of luck. I'm, I'm going to be asking questions at the end. And, and, and like Leanne, uh, take it away. Thank you, Mason. Thank you. OK, so I'm going to talk to you about the different roles of a designer within the denim industry. Let's get that up the top there. So why am I here and why do I want to talk about this? I, when I left uni, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I had this degree, but I didn't really have a clue on what route I wanted to take after that. I was so hung up on my first job being the right job that I took and it would dictate my rest of my career. But I want to share to you my experience and some of the companies I've worked for and some of the different roles that I've undertaken because it's not as you might imagine and hopefully by sharing my story it will help you discover that you can be a little bit more flexible than you may have imagined and then on the second part of this uh, talk that I'm going to do I'm going to give you an overview on the different market levels and how that might affect your design function you might take on more you might take on less and it's up to you and how you decide if that's more creative for you or less creative for you as a designer Okay, so this is my route. I've taken on some of these roles, such as merchandiser, fabric developer, product manager, and product developer. I left uni being so hung up on titles. I think when I was going for my first job, like I mentioned, I looked out, I blocked out a lot because I didn't think any of these kind of suited me. But as I will explain on the next slide, um, these are some of the roles that I took, which ended up still leading me to be a denim designer. And some of the panelists that have been speaking today and over the last few days, I spoke to these guys and they've also worked in fashion editorial, they've been buyers before they've been designers, PR assistants, very good friend was a competition winner that left college and didn't go back and still insanely successful um, and technical design. So you can move within fields. It's not that, you know, what, it depends how long you've been in the field, but it, you can move within areas within the industry too. And Nelson Mandela, I never lose, I either win or I learn. And all our jobs are experiences. So you'll learn what you do like and what you don't like. And hopefully when you go to your next role, you do more of what you enjoy and less of that you don't. So the companies I've worked for, they're also quite as diverse as some of the roles that I've taken. Um, my How I got into the industry uh, was quite fun. I got a call from my university one day asking if I was free for a Saturday to do um, to help out with the Burberry team swatching so I turned up naturally and I swatched my heart out for the first day in then at the end of the day they asked if I was free for another day and I ended up walking out with Burberry three and a half years later um, I was asked on the second day to do a full-on internship with them so which I accepted and then halfway through my internship as a fabric uh, assistant I had an incident at a photocopy machine with a very senior designer and this is where my na naivety kind of helped me out um, and I argued my case and why my job was slightly more important than his. <laughs> um, he went straight to my boss and got me transferred onto his department which is then when my internship carried on into design. Under him I was working with another designer um, at the time and he tasked us to work on the denim collection for the Burberry Brit line. So this is where my introduction to denim began. Once my internship came to an end, there wasn't really um, any availability in the design department. So I moved into product development, which was great. I got to learn exactly after the sketch or the creative side, what happens afterwards and how we can get what's in our brains actually made into full on garments. So that was a like, great experience. I really enjoyed my time there. 
once I left Burberry, I wanted to experience like a smaller high street brand. So I went to Firetrap as an SMU merchandiser, which was really fun. I got to use all the excess trims and excess fabrics and pull them together from like the rough bones of what the collection had and make special merchandise units. And we used to sell those discount retailers. After my time there, I went to Body Metrics and they had, they were really cool. They had a scanning pod at Selfridges and you'd be scanned for your size. So you didn't have to try on tons of jeans and it would uh, assign you um, a, a body fit. They had three of them and then which size you was allocated within those. So I was taught, brought on to help make their own brand because uh, they were um, sourcing from another brand and they wanted to bring it in house. And then, so you can kind of say I was product manager which is where the title thing kind of comes up. You're not necessarily defined by your title. Um, so I kind of semi was designing them, but not really until I went to CNA. So I moved to Germany, um, not a brand that I would have associated myself with. I was a bit of a snob when I left uni in terms of the brands that I wanted to work for and I aspired to were luxury. Um, but actually CNA, I got some of the best experience of my career. It was the first time um, since being an intern in Burberry that I got to be paid as a denim designer. Um, but also I traveled the world. I got to speak with people on the factory floor and learn from them directly. Um, and I also got to travel and seek inspiration from cities around the world. I moved home in 2014 to work for FNF, where I covered women's and denim, women's denim and woven bottoms with an assistant. Um, and then I went to New Look where I covered the same areas. Then in 2015, as Mawson uh, mentioned, I went to Timberland, where for the first time I covered menswear and I'd done women's wear hand in hand, but it was a bit less, so men's was really predominant and woven bottoms again. 2017, I went to Next Sourcing, which is the exclusive sourcing arm of Next, where I continued my menswear design and adopted woven bottoms still. And then in 2018, I decided to go freelance and I freelance for some of the mills that I would establish relationships with throughout my time as being designer for some of the brands that I've just spoken for, uh, some of the suppliers um, and some of the, the factories directly. The chief enemy of creativity is good sense. So if my experience can teach you anything, it's there is no logic. So don't, don't overthink your first role into the industry. Uh, just think that it's all happening for a reason. So don't don't overthink like I did. OK, so this is just a really quick um, I'm going to talk to you this, about uh, this table. It's it's kind of naive and it's kind of like to really look at roughly what happens. It won't cover everything. And this is just based on my experience. We're going to look at this table. I'm going to show you on the next few slides how that's visualized roughly. Um, and then we'll loop back to this table and look at the market levels and how you might be adopting uh, some of these and not adopting some of them, depending on if you're working for luxury high street or supplier side. So pre-design, you have your fabric sourcing and development and trim sourcing, um, and then your trend forecasting to see what's going to go forward. Your range plan will maybe come from your merchandising team and the factory sourcing strategy will come from your sourcing department. At design stage, You'll do your wash development and direction as a result of your trend forecasting uh, and you'll work on new blocks as well that may have been discovered from your trend. Trim design will come as a result of doing trim sourcing if you're a part of that. Designing the, and tech packing, as Laura has uh, in-depthly explained, it's a hugely important area and it's um, the more attention you give it, the better protos you're going to get. Uh, to garment stage, you're liaise with factories to make sure they understand your tech packs. Uh, resolve any issues and make sure everything's in the same place at the same time to be made. Post garment, you're, you, you're, so you'll have a proto, you, if it doesn't come in right, hopefully it does if you have all the information on the tech pack that Laura has helped explain. If not, you're fit and you're in the wash comments and then you'll present that final range to your team in the house. You'll probably do a presentation as well, pre-design just to set out for everyone in your company, this is what we're thinking. And you'll do that together with range planning and merch to say, that these are the pots of money that we believe in and then you'll loop back at this at the end. So roughly what this looks like in terms of visual, this range plan is something that Mawson might be familiar with, it's from um, Timberland. The idea of the range plan, it will be quite boring as an Excel sheet like this or something similar. Um, and it's just to, from a merchandising perspective to say this worked last season and this didn't work, this is the amount of money we have. 
these are roughly the areas that we want to allocate it to. We need X amount of core styles. We've got some money left over to do like some mid range price points. And then we've got some higher price points that we can also target. Yeah, um, at the same time, and this is in no particular order, you'll visit trade shows such as Kingpings to get um, fabric inspiration, understand what's trending along uh, with different mills, understand what's new in terms of sustainability, because that's forever changing. And obviously listen to the talks that Amy uh, shows, which she'll be talking about in the next talk. Um, as Malin's already explained in terms of like seeking inspiration, you might look towards catwalks, you know, there's loads of books that are super inspiring and magazines, look to history, go to exhibitions, go shopping around the world and create, gather vintage and hoard. And then you'll put all this into a trend report that you might distribute internally, or it might just be for your, your team to have a little look at just to know that everyone's on the same page. Um, once you've identified some of the key trends, uh, you'll loop back into the range plan to build in roughly, maybe some of what the bought samples have been, so it's visualized and then your merchandising team can also help chip in on this area. Uh, at this point, you'll probably present this to your heads off departments within your companies, just so that they've got an idea on what you're working towards. Um, so once you've done your shopping, hopefully it's vintage um, or it's from your own archive within the brands that you're working for, you'll assign your wash direction. Depending on seasonality, it'll either be towards the lighter and mids if it's summer and towards the darker and over dyes if it's winter. So you organise your wash direction, um, you'll do your sketch allocation uh, and you'll sketch into your designs uh, simultaneously whilst looking at fabric. So uh, you'll look at how many rigid you might need or stretch or cast colors and if your cast is not in the right fabric or you particularly like a construction you can liaise with the mill which is super inspiring um, and creative one of the fun things i like to do and work on different cast options within those fabrics you'll then assign your wash templates to your uh, chosen fabrics and then you get to select the thread and the trim accordingly which is also the stuff that goes on the tech pack as laura mentioned once you've sent your tech packs off, you will hopefully fly to your factory if you are able to, um, to review the samples in house so that you can speak directly to the people that have made the garments if there's any issues and work to resolve them. If not, which is the current climate that we're in, we have to adapt and we go to Zoom or we find different ways of talking to your factories and liaising and partnering with them. You'll review your samples to make sure that there's no um, Amalgamate, there's no uh, cannibalization in terms of like your, your washes. You don't want too much variety, but you want enough. So you relay it out and make sure that you've covered all your bases. You'll fit these samples to make sure they're ready for the customer. Um, and then you'll amend the wash if needed as well. Hopefully not. And then this is roughly what your presentation would might look like if once you've finished. So you'll do something similar, as I mentioned before, to pre, and then you'll loop back to do this at the end to say this is kind of what we've done as a result of what we said we was going to do. So now we look back at this table, and this is looking at luxury. So my experience, as you know, from um, when I spoke about earlier, is quite a big company. And I haven't worked for a luxury small company, so this could change depending on the size of the company as well, just to add to the complexity. Uh, Pre-design, you'll normally have a fabric and trims department separate, so you won't need to necessarily do that. Trend forecasting uh, is your role as a designer and your responsibility pretty much throughout the whole chain of um, levels. Range planning will pretty much be done by your merchandiser team, and then you'll have a separate sourcing team that takes over the factory sourcing strategy. Design stage, you will be setting the wash direction and development as a result of your trim forecasting. Trim design, you might lead, but it will be uh, taken, the responsibility will be with the trims team. And then any new blocks that have been identified through your trim forecasting, you'll work with your tech team to establish. And then you're designing the range and tech packing. Now you might have a front and back sketch only and then hand over to your PD and they'll finish the tech pack and do the details. Um, it depends really on what level you, what kind of level you wanna be involved in as a designer at luxury. And then going to garment stage, um, this is where your product developer would mainly take over at a luxury level. They'll liaise with the factories to make sure the tech pack's understood and resolve any issues if there are. Um, and unless it compromises the design, you won't really necessarily hear about it. 
and then uh, they'll call off the fabric and trim in alignment with the sourcing team. Post garment, you'll do the pre, you'll do the protos and pre-production. Um, any post will be taken over by your tech team, but you'll be responsible for making sure the protos are correct. And then presentations to the team that would probably be done by your merch team by all the international buyers that will come in ultimately at the end to buy the collection. But it's not, uh, you may have to do it to a small internal team to present. And then the wash comments, you'll be, you'll be given them, but it will be the responsibility of the uh, product developer to liaise that with the factory. So moving into high street, you take on a little bit more responsibility. Um, I've worked for big high street brands and small high street brands. So you may or may not have a fabric and trims team, but even if you do, they, the fabric teams are responsible for the whole uh, brand. So they cover a lot of different areas and not a lot of them are specialists within denim. And as a designer, we really have to know our fabric. Fabric is pivotal to the design, in my opinion. So we need to kind of source it. And we've been to the kingpins, we've done the research and the groundwork. So we have to know what it is so that we can build up from that. Trim sourcing, again, may or may not be involved in. Um, you get shown trims at Kingpin so you can see what the innovations are in terms of sustainability and whatnot. Trend forecasting, same as before. Range planning, again, merch, but they'll be doing it hand in hand with a buyer now. Um, and they'll also be doing the factory sourcing and strategy stage. Going into design, you're responsible for all of this, especially you, the one that you now take on, which is the difference from luxury, is the trim design if you are then sourcing it. And going into garment stage, you lose your product developers. So you are the one that will liaise with the factory and resolve any laundry and make issue with them, which is an incredible learning curve. You know, if you want to be the best at what you do, you need to learn and establish what happens before your role and what happens at the end when the product's made so that you can be the best that you can be. And the more knowledge we have, the less protos we'll need. So the more sustainable we can be as designers. Um, and then calling off the fabric and trim, that may happen with the sourcing team, or you may need to step in, or the factory will order that independently. Post garment, um, yep, so you will be re re uh, presenting the ranges to your teams internally, you'll be presenting uh, range direction uh, at pre-design stage, and then you'll loop back again, as I mentioned before, to present the final range that you've now developed and designed fit in same as before and wash comments you're now fully responsible for having lost your pd from luxury going into the supplier so um you kind of take on most of these roles now um so you probably won't have a fabric or a trims team and this is, again is based on my experience so my experience is working with mills that are fully vertical which means they make the fabric and they have the ability to cut and sew and launder the jean in one house um, I've worked for factories that work directly with brands and I've worked with suppliers that have a portfolio of uh, factories that they represent. So um, in that experience of mine, I've never had a fabric or trims team. It's always come from me. Sometimes it's directed by the customer. Sometimes it's not. Trend forecasting, same as before, you're responsible. Range planning and fabric sourcing, you might, uh, you'll have a product um, manager or an account manager that will work with you hand in hand on this but it's your responsibility as you are in any other brand to look at what's missing what you could be doing better and then you propose that to your customer design stage um, as before you take on all of that responsibility and garment stage two and i've highlighted in bold here the calling off fabric and trim because you probably will be helping coordinate that yourself post garment stage, instead of presenting the ranges to your internal teams, you'll be presenting these ranges to your customers. And that's the only thing that really changes. Fitting probably will be a little bit less here because it will be down to the individual customer to take your design then in-house um, and then fit where needed. And then the wash comments, you need to get the product right before you present it to your customer. Well, My you expectations did. versus experience. So I was prepared for when I left uni to be an innovator I wanted to be a trend forecaster because I love trend forecasting. And I knew, I, I kind of roughly knew I wanted to be a designer. So I was prepared for all these things. Um, Unique to denim, I would say is fabric and wash tech. Um, they're, it, we are working on such a beautiful product that is very technical. If you don't know your fabric, you can't utilize it in the best way. And you don't really know the washing capabilities unless you know your fabric. 
my unexpected learning. I didn't really expect to market my own ranges and get people on board and be a, a salesperson internally. I thought once I got a degree, people would listen, but it's not the case. Um, sustainability advisor, we are responsible for introducing sustainability more and more into our process as designers, as human beings, we need to be more responsible. Um, and in garment tech, I was rubbish at pattern cutting and sewing, so I really didn't expect to be taken on board that responsibility. Um, and then my continued learning, and this is the responsibility of us all, go to the factories, go to the mills, learn how it's being done, ask the questions, learn from the people that have been doing it their whole life. Um, we have to keep ahead of what's moving and how we can do better. So go to Genealogy and learn about the machines. I've just got a certificate in e-design software so I can help with uh, translating that to factories abroad. I've um, recently done a course on Future Learn, which is totally free to learn about more about fashion and sustainability. Read books. I need to geek up on my chemistry. So we're always, always learning. This is my last slide, Marcin. <laughs> Um, learn from yesterday, live for today, hope for tomorrow. The important thing is never to stop questioning. And a lot of people have said this, stay curious. No um, question is stupid. If you don't know the answer, ask the people that are making it why it can't be done. Challenge them. Um, and when you really unpick it and understand it, then sometimes you can establish like a, a solution together rather than it just being a no. So just always ask. Thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, because I've probably run over, you can email me as well. Uh, amazing. Thank you so much. Um, what's amazing about your career yeah, is, is, is you've, you've gone all over all over the whole whole, whole like, system. You've done development to design to even PD, you've done loads of things. So you're pretty much an all rounder now. And then and because you're a freelancer, you can do all these things. And if you're just if you're just concentrating on design the whole time, then, yeah, you can only do design. But the fact that you know you've done so much of the other stuff it's actually made you much stronger like that stronger designer that's why when you pitch yeah. this idea of like i would like to talk about this i went that's perfect for you because you've done so much of it but yeah yeah thank you. and it's um really important now because of the market and the climate that we're in you know people are making a lot of cutbacks in in brands so we have to be flexible and we may have to take on other roles that are now been uh, amalgamated so we have to learn and we to be the best we can be i really do believe you have to know the process from start to finish yeah. one question i'm sorry there's two on the screen and um, what like degree do, do, did you do prior to your experience so so that's a great question um i done um i was one of the first uh, years that we could do foundation degrees so i done a foundation degree in fashion design and marketing um, and having um geeked that totally i done quite well I got offered to do a bridging program at the end um, over a summer period, which was two weeks to see whether I was good enough to bridge onto a final year of a different degree. So another year later, um, I, I graduated with a full BA ONS in product development and design for the fashion industry at LCS. Oh, that's superb. Now I've been following your like career as well, and you've done you've done so well at, at, at Timberland, and we share a lot of friends as well. So anyway, all the best to you. You are superb, and thank, thank you. you so much for your time. You're um, very welcome. Brilliant stuff.